You spot a goblin crouched like a cat lying in wait. Just when you least expect it, you're on his back and he's taking you on what will surely be the wildest and most terrifying ride of your life. The puka, a shape-shifting goblin, terrorizes his victims at night and plays cruel jokes. He carries unwilling riders through brambles and narrow cliffs and bestows magical gifts? Existing somewhere between boogeyman, scapegoat, and temperamental fae, the known trickster animal spirit was once dreaded across Ireland, the Channel Islands, and England, and has survived the test of time. Don't believe me? Just ask Shakespeare. I'm Dr. Emily Zarka, and this is Monstrum. This monster's influence is demonstrated by its hotly debated etymology. Puka means goblin in Old English. But did that word come from Scandinavian, Germanic, or Celtic origins? Some scholars trace it back to Icelandic roots, others say Norwegian origins, and others Old Danish or Old Swedish. And there's arguments to be made for Irish, Welsh, and the Cornish etymology as well. That's a lot of colloquial contention. The commonality is that in every language the term refers to a negative spirit, a mischievous monster. Because the definition is the same across so many different languages, yet no one clear origin, to me that suggests that this monster was around for a very long time before spreading across Northern Europe. Like a lot of monsters, the name might differ depending on who is telling the tale and where they are telling it, but the basic characteristics are consistent. An expressly animal spirit, they threaten death but do not kill, they can bestow kindness but generally prefer cruelty, and they are encountered at night and during the harvest time where they frolic through the hay. While these shape-shifting tricksters can choose to take on any animal form, they favor cows, dogs, donkeys, goats, and horses, particularly a small shaggy pony. In some regions, they even take on a diminutive humanoid form. Their otherworldly nature is indicated by completely black coloring or animal features like ears, horns, or tail. The puka seems to exist mainly to harass late night travelers, spooking them out of their wits. Their favorite way to do this? Unexpected rides through the countryside. Yep. The monster lies in wait before popping up, tossing their victim onto their backs, and bolting across the landscape with little thought for the safety or comfort of the rider. They intentionally run through thorny bushes, alongside stone walls, and on the precipice of cliffs. These death-defying rides rarely result in serious harm to the rider, other than the pure terror. In some instances, the monster takes pity on the naive traveler and might happily trot them home, but it is also known to spoil wild fruits by urinating or spitting on them. In one story, the puka gifts a magical flute to a piper that makes him famous, but only after playing a few cruel jokes on him first. According to legend, this is the same flute that makes people dance until they die, which seems like a questionable gift, to say the least. Another interesting trait of this monster? He talks. According to the tale, a farmhand, while putting away the cows after milking, finds himself tossed onto the back of a young horse. Throughout the night, the horse takes him on a rough, harrowing ride across the countryside. The next morning, quite bruised and worse for wear, he tells his boss of the encounter. The man's advice? wear spurs. When the horse appears again, the young man asks to ride on its back, but the cunning creature seems to sense something is afoot. It asks, have you the sharp things on? When the farmhand confirms he does, the horse retreats. But this is not the last the farmhand will see of the monster. Returning from a party one night, the man is startled when a horse jumps off the path and knocks him down, covering the man with his body in a protective stance. A bright light blasts down on the path at that same moment. The creature rises, stating that it saved him from being killed by a spirit. When the farmhand asks who saved him, the horse replies, I am the puka. There are many variations of this puka tale. The bright light may be interpreted as a demonic force, but more commonly the spirit or spirits the story is referring to are the good people, the fey folk. In every version of this legend, and there are a lot, the puka never calls the spurs by their name. The monster refers to them only as sharp things, regardless of if the story is told in English, Gaelic, or any other language. The puka's aversion is important enough that even in one story where the creature attacks a fisherman, the man is able to defeat the puka by attaching a row of hooks on his heels like spurs. Spurs are used to control horses, so why would a supernatural being have such a hatred of the sharp things? Well, spurs are traditionally made from steel or iron. 
Those of you with a little knowledge of the Fae might recognize the folkloric significance of iron, which is said to deter or injure them. The Puka's reluctance to even speak the word for spur might be a nod to this tradition and could hint at the monster's own lineage. The Puka's connection to the good people of Celtic lore reiterates that its origins are quite old. While monks who came to Ireland started writing down these traditions around the 17th century, be assured that oral storytelling was an integral part of Irish culture long before that. And remember, these stories are not memorized scripts, but ever-changing performances between Shanaki, traditional Gaelic storytellers, and audience. As Christianity's influence grew in Ireland, the animal trickster spirit is replaced by a guardian angel or other angelic being in the farmhand narrative, turning the story into one about the divine influence of God rather than puka intervention. The puka remains relatively the same in appearance and action across Ireland and other parts of Europe, even as Christianity becomes more prevalent. Sometimes characteristics have important enough moral, cultural, and social meaning that they need to remain the same. Take the monster's connection to the Wild Hunt, an archaic folklore trope involving a divine or semi-divine figure leading a band of supernatural entities and or the dead on a nighttime horseback hunt that causes general havoc and fear amongst humans. The Wild Hunt is linked back to ancient cults of fertility, death, ancestor worship, and magic. The Puka, who forcefully takes humans on death-defying rides, could fit right into this narrative, which would make it very old indeed. The places the puka appear often bear that name and have ecological and economic importance or value. There are marshes, rocks, waterfalls, caverns, wells, and other spots across Northern Europe with some variation of puka as part of their place names, designating biological habitats and resources that should be left undisturbed by man. Places like Polan Puka and Puckstown. In Fea Puka in Kerry County, Ireland, it was said a puka resided undisturbed by mortals in a particular marsh for over a century, until a young man named Tim Dorney inherited the land and decided to cut the marsh up with drains and dishes. Driven from its home, the puka becomes enraged and begins harassing Tim's family. One night while surveying his land for stray cattle, Tim finds himself on the back of a monster who is galloping at a furious pace. Held on by an invisible force, Tim is unable to dismount. The monster scrapes him against stone walls through bushes and eventually almost throws him off a cliff, deciding at the last second to spare him, satisfied by the man's immense fear. Tim is enraged by this encounter and swears revenge on the creature. He takes to wearing long neck spurs and carries a weighted whip with an iron grip. When the puka takes him for another wild ride, it suffers great pain from these devices. These sharp things are enough to deter the puka for a time. Years pass until one night when Tim is returning home from a late night card game. He comes across a small horse tied up next to the bank of a river. The docile horse wears a straw saddle with a white thorn branch tucked inside. The white thorn plant is said to be unlucky and can attract fairies. Tim recognizes this warning, salutes the puka, and continues to walk home. But this won't be the end of his run-ins with the monster. The puka avenges his injuries by driving Tim's horses off a cliff. Horses that were carrying butter meant to pay Tim's rent. And without the butter, Tim loses the farm and the puka reigns victorious, having rid himself of an inhospitable family. This story is a cautionary tale against disrupting nature, but it also promotes something else, a reverence for folklore. Tim can keep his life and his land for a longer period only because he recognizes the white thorn branch as a warning, promoting the idea that these so-called superstitions and legends protect those who know them. Any crops left after Samhain are considered tainted by the puka, and in some places the monsters left offerings as placation. This might be a way to encourage resource management and ensure the harvest is fully collected before it can spoil. Even when ridiculed, the legends of the puka are acknowledged as part of national and cultural histories. And over time, the monster's integration into literature and popular fiction solidifies its place as a common social convention. Puck, the mischievous, shape-shifting narrator of Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream, clearly borrows its name and nature from the puka tradition. Like the folkloric figure, Shakespeare's Puck, the merry wanderer of the night, is unbothered by the effects of his actions on humans, which include misleading night wanderers, crafting potions, pouring drinks on people, and turning human heads into donkey heads. But don't think the Puka's influence ended centuries ago. 
It appears in the guise of a black goat with long horns standing on its hind legs in Thomas Crofton Crocker's Fairy Legends and Traditions in the 19th Century, a text whose great popularity undoubtedly introduced many more people to the creature. In 20th century plays and movies, the Puka's legend influences characters, sometimes in a comedic way. In a 1950 film, Harvey, a giant rabbit, appears only to main character Elwood. Harvey is mischievous, pulling pranks and causing confusion. About a decade later, a more direct association turns up in the movie Darby O'Gill and the Little People. An Irish king owns a mischievous horse that can change color, disappear, and is named Puka. In the 21st century, we get more modern and metaphorical versions of the puka. Fans, and some scholars, I'm both, of the 2001 cult classic Donnie Darko believe a puka is at its core, one who leans into the more malevolent mischievousness of the monster. Then there's Puka from the Into the Dark Horror Anthology. This might be the most unusual and unnerving interpretation of the puka, a toy that records what its owner says in either naughty or nice mode. When an actor is hired to wear the promotional fursuit version of the character, an interesting take on the monster's shape-shifting abilities, it quickly consumes him, taking over his personality. Stories of the puka continue to circulate today, both in oral tradition and popular culture. Whatever form this shape-shifting creature takes, it always manages to disrupt the lives of those around it, for better or worse. The very malleability of the puka's form helps it endure. Who knows what shape it will take next? Am I on the right mark? Yep, you're perfect. Sorry. It was literally right in front of my oh, face. No one is dead. Okay. Nature indicated with completely black coloring or animal features like ears, horns, or a tail. <laughs>